Welcome to the relatively new series here on Reinvent the Humanities to Change the World. This is a series that we're launching in partnership with Georgetown University. I'm Peter Leiden. I'm the founder of Reinvent, who is partnering here with Georgetown to really explore deeply the role of the humanities in the past, but also looking forward to today's world and also the future, the role of the humanities, how it can actually be elevated or fully appreciated and make a bigger impact on a lot of the issues and challenges that we face out there today. And to, today we're just going to focus on an in-depth interview uh, with a really interesting uh, member of the Georgetown community, actually. Uh, John O'Malley is a university professor that's the top-tier professor in the theology department at Georgetown. He especially is in the history of religious culture in early modern Europe, particularly Italy. And he actually is going to help us here think about the roots, essentially, of teaching the humanities, uh, the roots of the Jesuit tradition, and also of Georgetown's tradition as we go forward here. So, John, it is uh, terrific to have you here. And um, one of the things in researching this, uh, which I'd like you to talk about, is uh, the, the origins of the way we think of the humanities, uh, teaching the humanities, uh, as opposed to the teaching of more professionalized uh, university courses. You have some interesting uh, insights into how that actually happened in early modern Europe. Do you want to tell us a little bit about that? Well, uh, the uh, the roots of the humanities, of course, go way back to ancient Greece and Rome, uh, but they coalesce, coalesced in the 15th century in Italy in the Italian Renaissance. So uh, this was called the they called this uh, reinvention and relaunching of the humanities. They called it the the Studia Humanitatis, Latin Studia Humanitatis, studies of humanity, or as I translate it. Uh, studies of what it means to be human. So this was a, an ancient tradition, but in the Renaissance it had a, uh, a little bit of a polemical edge because uh, the great moment in Western intellectual and cultural history was the 13th century with the invention, the creation of the institution we know as the university. There were two to begin with, one in Paris and one in Bologna. They were like in many ways, but also different in other ways. And uh, what they had in common, which is what universities today also have in common, is a twofold purpose. What was that purpose and what is that purpose? The first one was intellectual problem solving or as we would say today, the creation of knowledge. And secondly, career advancement through the acquisition of professional skills. So in the 13th century, 14th century, 20th century, 21st century, people go to college to get a better job. That is to acquire skills, they want to get a better job. Well, that's very admirable. That's just, and this is a great advance, really, in Western intellectual and cultural history. However, what these Italian, we can call them humanists, uh, objected to was the fact that, yeah, what, but what about the student himself or herself? This type of education doesn't pay any attention to the emotional, physical, spiritual, religious development of the student. And we have a program, a philosophy of education, that, in our opinion, does precisely that. We believe that we can, by studying certain subjects, the student and the teacher are led to ask questions about human life itself. What is it to be human? What is right? What is wrong? Where am I going? Uh, what are the conflicts in human emotion? So, in the university, you ask questions about your profession or your trade or your discipline. In the humanities, you ask questions about life itself. You ask questions about yourself. So with that, these two traditions got launched into the West, and we see them operative today. So that's a little <laughs> mini uh, course through about 500 years of history. So how does that sound, Peter? 
Good start. Good start. Well, let's let's pick up on that. So so there was literally different schools at the time. My understanding, um, again from reading some of your your work, there were literally two kinds of schools. Did the people of that time though see the humanities um, not just as well? It would be a nice thing to have, but as a practical thing in a way, a, a well-rounded person, a person who can solve problems, a person who can contribute to society needs a humanities background. I mean, how did they think of it, and and how did those parallel systems operate? interact to each other at the time? Well, they interacted in many ways, and they borrowed from one another. They were rivals, but they were also partners. What the uh, uh, one skill that the humanists said that they taught was a uh, skill in speaking. Uh, so rhetoric was a central the climax of the curriculum. So rhetoric is basically oratory, so the speech act. So the uh, what the... Uh, they said, this is, after all, after all, the most practical skill. No matter what position you're in, you have to be able to say what you mean, and there's an ethical side to it, to mean what you say, and uh, that way you understand and you, and you can persuade people. So it had a twofold purpose, therefore. So if you are able to, you have a command of words, you have a command of vocabulary, have a command of literature, you might say, uh, you can persuade others to your point of view. Uh, but secondly, there's a real philosophy of learning or knowledge underneath this. Secondly, you don't really have the thought until you have the word to go with it. And that's what our training will help you do, to help you uh, get the right words for what you're trying to do. So it will basically will help you think. So uh, that was one of their claims. So but there are two sides to it, as I, I mentioned. The, there's the say what you mean and mean what you say. It's an ethical component. So in this tradition, there was this always this strong ethical component and specifically, most specifically, a component to work for the common good, to work for your common good of your family, of your neighborhood, of your city, of the world in general, of your country, the world in general. So uh, now, so they, they said that this, this is what the university doesn't do, uh, okay? <laughs> That's interesting. Well, so now in the same kind of period, and, and talk to us a little bit about the origins of the Jesuit um, order, because in fact it literally came out of this, these two kind of traditions, <clears throat> the, the whole order and its kind of tradition of intellectual kind of inquiry came out of it. Can you, can you explain again to a general audience who, who might not be familiar with this how, how that worked? Okay, so the Jesuits were founded in 1540 by 10 graduates of the University of Paris, led by Ignatius of Loyola. So that's a very important fact. So these men met at the University of Paris. They bonded, bonded together and with the idea of evangelizing, going to the Holy Land, uh, and sticking together in a religious life. And in 1540, they decided to found a, founded a new religious order. So the the important fact here is that they were all university graduates, masters of arts degrees from the University of Paris, which was a high class degree. So they knew what university education was all about. At this point, they did not have any idea they were going to be running schools. But they get to Italy, and there this humanist tradition was already moving along very, very rapidly. And uh, Ignatius of Loyola saw a real compatibility between what these humanists were trying to do and what the Jesuits were trying to do. So that is to say the formation, the education, the Christian education of uh, uh, young men and eventually young women. So the spiritual exercises is about a, a spiritual formation and the humanists said, that's what we do. We do a different way, but we are about a human formation too. So that, in my opinion, was the motivation which prompted the Jesuits in 1548 to open their first school. 
It was a humanistic school, basically, and it was a huge success. So that's how they moved in. But they were university graduates. So they, unlike some others in the era, they did not see a contest, a conflict between these two traditions, but felt that they could work together and work together. So along with most of the Jesuit schools in this era, and then really into the almost the 20th century, were these humanistic schools. But some of them were real universities because they taught practical, the, the professional skills as well. So that's hmm. you know, a thumbnail sketch. Does that make any sense? It totally makes sense, and this is a good. And again, we're thinking about a broader audience to really appreciate the, this whole this whole lineage here. So the Jesuit order then became a very intellectual order, and actually, it, over time, established many different schools all over the world. Right? Do you want to tell us a little bit of the, the again your short history of the Jesuits, and actually, for that matter, um, Georgetown came out of that too. But it's, uh, talk a little bit about the expansion globally of, of this of this kind of a, this concept essentially of, of education. Well, two things to keep in mind. One, by 1550, the Jesuits were into formal schooling in a big way, and it became really their primary ministry. On the other hand, they were founded as a missionary order. So the two things go hand in hand, so this meant that they were going to be sort of worldwide, and almost every place they went, they founded uh, schools. So... Uh, Really, they're, they're, they're by, the, by the middle of the 17th century, their network of schools worldwide was stunning. For instance, in what we would call today call Belgium, that area, uh, about the size of the state of Maryland, uh, they had 34 schools. Can you imagine? That's a school about every every 15 miles, and two of them were universities. <laughs> then, and so there was a similar pattern all through Europe, especially in, well, in Western Europe, but also in, in Slovakia, uh, Slovenia, uh, into Poland, and so forth, uh, and then worldwide. So about the same time, I think they were there were uh, 10 schools in New Spain, as I say, present-day Mexico, a similar number in Peru. Uh, it was a large area then, not, not just Peru as we know it today. So also in uh, Japan. So, and in Japan, what's interesting is uh, they founded a really kind of a unique kind of school. They founded a conservatory for artists. So they imported European artists and worked with uh, Chinese and Japanese artists, and really created a new kind of somewhat, somewhat hybrid uh, art form. It became a, a large school. Uh, they made bells. There was a foundry, uh, other art objects, but also especially painting. So, so, so just to clarify here, so there, when they established a university in that era. Did they literally have two kind of sides of the, like the humanities and the more professional? I mean, did they coexist in those schools as opposed to other universities that did not have that humanities dimension? Yes. So that was one feature that was special to the Jesuits, that wherever they had a university, they also, I mean, they started usually with a humanistic school and then the university, or when they founded the university, the humanistic school was taken for granted that that would also be there. So this is a really a, a, the first real uh, institutionalization of the wedding of these two traditions in institutions. Now, other universities were, you know, being influenced by the humanistic movement, so uh, can't be absolute here. But no, this is something that, is, that was special to the Jesuits and has turned out to be today. Uh, special to especially special to Georgetown and to other Jesuit universities. Well, we'll talk a little bit about that. Given, um, you know, we'll talk about Georgetown. So again, to a general audience, doesn't think about that. So, so it's a rel it, from an American point of view, it's 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 long lived. So, to, but tell the roots of Georgetown and and how it picked up that tradition in the United States here. Well, it's very interesting. Yeah, Georgetown was was founded in 1789. That's when we accepted our first student by 
Bishop John Carroll. Uh, it was the first school of any kind for an informal school for Catholics in the what was then by 1789 the United States, uh, because at that time the Jesuits were the only priests in the United States. Uh, they were not a large number, there were about 30 at that time, but still they were the only priests. So how that happened? It's very interesting. John Carroll came from an extremely wealthy family. Uh, he and his brother and his cousin were sent to France, then present-day German, uh, Belgium, today France, Saint-Omer, where the English Jesuits were running a school. So John Carroll had a humanistic education at Saint-Omer. He was there. He stayed there. He graduated from that school, joined the English, English Jesuits, and stayed there for about another 15 years until 1773 when he returned to the United States. And eventually he was appointed bishop. So he, he knew what a Jesuit school was. And he was one of the few Maryland Jesuits who did because they had not had that kind of benefit of that kind of an education. So that was his idea what he found at Georgetown. And what's extremely interesting explicitly for students of all faiths, open to students of all faiths. So it was not a narrow confessional school at all. It was open to students of all faiths. So that's the origin of the university. Well, was that unusual to be open to all faiths in terms of Georgetown vis-a-vis -vis other Jesuit schools, or, or was that part of the broader tradition? of? of well, uh, it's to a large extent part of a larger tradition because even there in the 16th century, when religious polemics between Catholics and Protestants were so strong, the Jesuits accepted uh, Lutheran, Calvinist, and other students into their schools. Uh, this is really remarkable. I mean, I remember I mentioned that in my book on the early Jesuits, and the great uh, historian of education in the early modern period, Professor Paul Grendler, said, are you sure of that? I can't find that hard to believe. I said, yes, it's absolutely certain. They're, for instance, in Prague. They had Lutheran and Hussite students, and they didn't have to go to Mass. Of course, they didn't have to go to confession. They didn't have to go to the Litany of the Saints or anything like that. But they did have to uh, listen to sermons and a few other things. But other than that, they they operated uh, in, the, in the Jesuit school. So it's an old tradition. Um, now, in terms of this humanist tradition within the universities, uh, it's obviously spread to other universities now and what we consider kind of modern universities. So, so how did that actually get picked up in, in, in a broader university movement? And, and, and can you give us a little broad strokes on, on that diffusion of that kind of concept? Well, so we've been talking about the Jesuits in, in the 16th century, but what we need to realize is that uh, the Jesuits had no monopoly on this humanistic tradition. As a matter of fact, the, uh, the humanists, especially Erasmus, were great propagandists, and they convinced Europe that you were not truly educated unless you were humanistically educated. So uh, the humanistic tradition was pan-European, and as it got into the University of Cambridge and Oxford very strongly, into other universities, and then uh, other humanistic schools sprang up all over Europe. So in that regard, the Jesuit schools were only a species within a, within a genre. But uh, so, uh, for instance, the, the uh, schools that were founded, Harvard, Harvard College was basically founded as a humanistic school and only gradually developed into a university. That is, they began to add professional schools. And that's exactly what happened at Georgetown. So uh, what I think is, is, is special about uh, Georgetown, the Jesuit tradition, is we have, a, uh, I think, a clearer idea of what these, this tradition is supposed to do. And also, we have a spirituality out of the spiritual exercises that you know more or less correlates with what the humanists were trying to do. So it's it's kind of bolstered in the Jesuit tradition, but it's the same tradition. However, what's happened, I think, is for instance in well, even at Georgetown, but I mean you see it especially at other institutions, uh, the humanities have been become so professionalized 
that uh, they're somewhat indistinguishable from other uh, technical subjects and the big vision that the humanist had for what this education was supposed to do has been kind of lost. Let me let me come right to the point. Here's what I think the here's what I believe the humanists were trying to do, but this is kind of the tradition all the way through. There were four things they were trying to do that they said their style of education would do. One was the way I put it, get the fly out of the bottle. That is to say, it would break down in students their more parochial vision. Uh, let them see other cultures, other perspectives, and so forth. That so, you know, what I what was the going prejudice in my neighborhood is not necessarily a good one. So get the fly out of the bottle. So breadth. Another thing they tried to do was to give a sense of heritage. So you are the product of the past. Uh, you're the product of the kind of education your parents gave you. And you're the product of larger movements in Western culture. So if you understand those, you have a better understanding of yourself. You have a better understanding of where you are. Moreover, this gives you a perspective, a perspective on the present. You realize things were not always thus. So you have that kind of perspective. Third thing, which I have already mentioned, was this uh, ability to say what you mean and mean what you say, especially say what you mean, that this was a training in speaking, persuading, but also in thinking. As, as Mark Twain says, the difference between the right word and the almost right word is the difference between a lightning bolt and a lightning bug. So then that thing, the th first point would be to mean what you say, that is to say the ethical component. And here, as I said in the beginning, the social element was especially strong. The, uh, the very beginning of the humanist movement, it was to this would, to, would be to help the commonwealth, to help the common good. Uh, and one of the great theorists of this style of education was the old Roman orator and statesman Cicero. And he has wonderful passages in a book of his that uh, on, on duties. Uh, we're not born for ourselves alone. We have a duty to other people. So that's very much in the Christian tradition and very much in the Jesuit tradition. And that's, uh, so universities, sure intellectual problem solving, and career advancement. Solid. But there's, uh, there are other dimensions to it if you take this humanistic tradition seriously. This is fascinating. Uh, perfect. perfect. Re really interesting. So, so those four pieces, if you had to kind of bring them today, wouldn't you make an argument that those are just as valid today as they ever kind of were in terms of... What's Absolutely. Going? No, I, I mean, that's my argument that these traditions in, were there from the beginning in different forms and not articulated precisely the way I articulate them. They were there in the 15th century, they were there in the 17th, 18th, 19th century, and today. So we kind of reformulate them a little bit, but basically it's the same tradition. And uh, so this tradition requires a certain kind of certain kinds of works, right? I mean, literature is a great one because there you see the interaction of people. You you you're exposed to good literature, so it helps you speak well and think well. But uh, the complexity of the human situation, then ethics raises these big questions, theology raises these big questions about life. And so, yes, uh, I mean, and I, you know, the today there's this thing that, well, the one or the other. Well, I really feel that in myself, uh, I want to help students. Uh, hone their professional skills. I want to enable them to have the practical, professional, and technical skills they need to get a good job, as we say. But at the same time, I want to, insofar as I can, help them as human beings and help them to, you know, think about themselves uh, as they do, but to help them. Uh, so 
I think in the person of the teacher, these two can go together. Well, in, in fact, knowing about themselves and all these things that you talked about in that humanistic side, I mean, they actually make you a better work, you know, better in your work, better in your absolutely. job, better in your career. No, no, yeah, so absolutely, you're absolutely right. And uh, the, uh, the kind of breadth that the humanist tradition brings helps you think more broadly and, and I think it kind of sparks the imagination a little bit and that's the core of inventiveness, right? Of being original. So uh, if you're yeah. a, just a, nothing but a technocrat, that's all you know are the nuts and bolts. If you have a little broader vision, you can move things. Well, this is interesting. And given your perspective in your, your career, essentially as a university professor now, a long, long career here, do you think that there is a... Uh, how do you think the appreciation from the outside world of the humanities has evolved, let's say, over even your lifetime? Do you feel there's a sense now that they're maybe more underappreciated now than they might have been in past eras? Well, if I look at my own lifespan, I would say that when I was young, uh, most schools, uh, universities, and colleges kind of took the, humanists, uh, the, the, the uh, humanistic uh, subjects for granted. They were they were the curriculum, the basic curriculum, but they did so without really too much reflection upon them. And I think that's been that's the problem, why we face a problem today. So then, uh, for instance, in the United States after the Second World War, with the GI Bill and so many people going then to university and college, uh, they wanted something practical. So unless you had a good argument for the humanities, they didn't make much sense. They didn't. So what's the use of it? What's the use of you know reading Dickens? Uh, how's that going to help me uh, get get a job and advance so forth? So I think that's the reason. No, today, uh, unlike uh, say 50 years ago when they were kind of taken for granted, the humanities are really under siege. There's a lot of lot written about uh, in defense of the humanities, but I I must say I, I suppose I'm kind of egotistical, but I really feel that some of these Arguments are not very convincing. For instance, we had here at Georgetown a very distinguished historian from Princeton uh, who did a defense of the humanities, and basically what he said was, well, do, do the humanities will help you think better. Mm -hmm. Well, isn't that what all courses help you do? <laughs> I mean, uh, don't they help you think better? So that's part of what the humanities do, but Advantage have uh, have other dimensions that are more distinctive of them. Well, well so, so so you say it's been under siege literally for the last fifty years post war. But do you feel, let's say, in the last fifteen years, has there been any kind of differentiation from what it was in the late twentieth century? I mean, do you feel it's less appreciated now, or pretty much the same as it's been, or or, or any new stresses coming under with budget cuts and things? I'm just curious how you see it now. Well, yes, I, I mean, I don't. Uh, it doesn't look very good right now. Uh, in most schools, the uh, uh, sort of the, the more pragmatic approach is, uh, you know, sort of dominating in, in a way, in a, an exclusivist way that did not so dominate before. So uh, I think those of us who uh, believe in the humanities and believe what, what they can do, what they're supposed to do, uh, need to. Uh, be out there crusading. <laughs> well, it's a little bit about what this, this series is about. This, this, this is a fascinating interview to start the series. Um, but now, how about from the internal point of view? You made some reference to kind of self-inflicted wounds a little bit, you could say, maybe from inside the humanities and academia. There's been this professionalism. Has there been a kind of losing sight of, of the I think so, say, yes. Academia? Is, talk, talk about that a little bit. Well, uh, again, I feel that I have a kind of a privileged vantage point because my original academic specialty was Renaissance humanism. So I really feel that uh, I have a, a good grasp of it in its breadth, and then also being a Jesuit helps also. Uh, so uh, I feel that so many of the arguments in favor of the humanities are very superficial and uh, don't have that sense of heritage and perspective. They don't know the real origins 
of the humanities. They don't know, really know about this conflict between university education and humanistic education that erupted in the 15th century. This is not something new. Uh, so they don't know that, so they can't, I mean, my four points, uh, sure the fact that, uh, well, going to help you speak better or and think better. Well, think better, yes, that, that's, sort of, but to speak better, not so much emphasized, to a uh, sense of heritage and perspective, not really articulated clearly, uh, to be uh, people dedicated, I mean, to not be born for yourself alone, as Cicero said, uh, or as the Jesuits say, men and women for others. That's not there. Uh, so uh, I think it's a kind of a truncated approach to the humanities. Do you feel also this professionalism within you? You made reference to it earlier. I just want you to maybe elaborate a little bit on it. Um, <clears throat> that there's been a kind of trying to become more like a scientific uh, kind of, or, or, or kind of engineering field or to scientific field, and, and it's it, to the detriment maybe of, of the of the humanism. I mean, of, of being too specialized, maybe too focused, too too. Uh, too much into the, the the particular thing, and not as much into the the breadth of kind of the tradition. Well, I'm just throwing that out there. What, what, what some any thoughts on what what else is happening? Yeah, well, I'd say two sides to it. I mean, it? you certainly we need the. Uh, I mean, I myself am a product of a professionalization of the historical uh, profession, right? Uh, historical uh, job. Uh, and uh, I very much appreciate that. It's given me a wonderful critical sense and, uh, you know, perspective and so forth. So that's good. But if that happens too early, uh, then that's when you do lose the, uh, the more humanistic value of studying history, that it gives you... Uh, a sense of your place in the world and without being a professional and gives you a sense of perspective and so forth and uh, in doing history you're reading some very fine works and so forth so uh, two things so I might say this just for clarification that the humanistic tradition was uh, a tradition of education for people in their earlier stages. So even in the uh, so in this well in antiquity, when uh, uh, everybody was educated humanistically, that was the standard education of the Roman and Greek world. But then some went on. To go to Greece or to Egypt and to study philosophy, which meant philosophy then meant uh, also natural philosophy, that is to say, uh, study of the physical world, so the seedbed of modern science. So the uh, undergraduate curriculum, at least the first two years, is the place where this humanistic tradition should be, in my opinion, uh, more cultivated and not, you know, sort of be eliminated for too early a profession, professional uh, uh, courses. Hmm. One other thing then, too, to follow up, I mentioned this public service side of things. Um, in, in, in other things that we're seeing in, in um, this, this younger generation that they call the millennial generation, uh, kind of age 35 to 18, there's a kind of a cohort, the way the baby boomers were kind of thought about. Um, there has been a lot of talk about how there is a lot of sense of wanting public service and volunteerism and this kind of common good feeling that instead of going on to Wall Street, they want to work for Teach for America and others. Do you feel there's some different kind of thing going on in this generation of students that you've been seeing the last decade or so. Um, is, is there anything different than you might say or anything more hopeful maybe on, on that kind of aspirational side of, of education? Well, I really can't comment in any sort of intelligent way on that okay. except to say that uh, the uh, 
my experience with students is that there uh, there's always an idealism there lurking somewhere and what you need to do is to tap into it and see if you can tap into it so certainly there are I mean I think for instance the time of the uh, the Second World War I mean idealism and fighting for liberty and so forth that was a, a national you know uh, trait really and I don't see it that strongly now but certainly uh, as an educator as a humanistic educator I think I need to believe in this idealism and I do believe in this idealism because it tallies with my experience of students you have been one of the first uh, interviews you've done here it has been a fantastic interview it has opened my horizons on kind of the depth and the how long this has been an issue and that we've been working on it for for centuries here uh, and we really do appreciate the time you've taken to do this and uh, we look forward to kind of working with this material and adding it to everything we learn and um, hopefully moving the ball a little bit here so Thank you very much, John. You've been Thank you very much, Peter. Yep. What a great conversation. Thank you. Bye-bye.